6.30 in the morning on Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, the day of rest, Hamas launches a, an attack. The biggest trauma that's ever happened to the state of Israel in 50 years. There, there is every temptation <laughs> when you see all these news items, NPR, the New York Times, and, and this one and that one, and this Hollywood celebrity, to start to think to yourself, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe Israel is somehow, you know, really the, the, the aggressor here. And it takes real wisdom and, and discernment to, to hold that line. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. All right, over the weekend, I was, um, and this past week, you probably have seen the reports about the attacks on Israelis, innocent Israeli civilians, men, women, and children by Hamas terrorists. And it's just been gut-wrenching. My timeline has been filled with these stories about the atrocities committed. I think the death toll is now 900 people who have been killed in Israel by militants who crossed the border in a surprise attack. Those listening, I know this is a very controversial issue for some people. Some people very clearly see this as Israel has been attacked and they must fight back to defend their very existence. But then there are other strong narratives in American media today, and even among some people on the right, some Christians, who say that, well, Israel isn't just an innocent party here. Israel has also is also at fault for a decades-long conflict. And so we're going to actually explore that. We're going to get into what are the prevailing narratives right now about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're going to have a great expert on the show today. We're going to have Robert Nicholson on the show today, who's the founder and the president of the Philos Project, to walk us through some of the history, answer some of the tough questions questions about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's extremely eye-opening and end with ultimately a call for seeing that this is more than a geopolitical battle playing out, more than a battle between warring factions or the state of Israel and the Palestinian people, but that this is also a spiritual battle. I learned a lot in this conversation with Robert. I think you will too. And I think it's important for all of us to learn about the conflict unfolding in the Middle East, about the state of Israel and the persecution of Jewish people, which is an ongoing persecution that is real, especially in the last century. And we should be as educated as possible as we pray for those innocents who are under attack and those that have been wounded and those that have lost loved ones. But before we get into this important interview with Robert, I want to announce a new sponsor for the podcast. I'm really excited to partner with Good Ranchers. If you haven't heard of Good Ranchers already, they are an independent premier American meat company with all of the meat, the delicious steaks and chicken and even fish sourced from United States, usually small farms, farmers and ranchers across the country. Good Ranchers is ethically sourced meat. It is best quality meat. I got my first packet from Good Ranchers to check them out a month or so ago. And both my husband and I are sitting down and having one of their steaks and saying, this is the best steak that we've had this year. You're not going to find better steak in your grocery store. You're going to find it if you can order from Good Ranchers. Their chicken also, we're like, this chicken is amazing. And it's because this is locally sourced, usually grass-fed chicken and beef that is farmed in our communities, ranch, you know, by ranchers in our communities instead of being imported in, often frozen from hundreds and thousands of miles away. Good Ranchers has a special approach to quality. They are an American, a proud American company. And really beautifully, Good Ranchers is a company that supports our values of being pro-life and pro-family. You're not only going to love this meat and consider it the best meat you've had. You're not going to find anything like Good Ranchers meat in your grocery store. You're going to find the most delicious steaks and chicken and fish from Good Ranchers. But you're also going to know that by supporting this family-run company, you're supporting our values. You're supporting the pro-life movement. You're supporting our pro-family values. So today you can go to GoodRanchers.com. You can sign up for your starter pack or subscription service. And guess what? You can use the code Lila for $30 off your first pack. It's super easy to do. They'll send you a selection, one of the starter packs that I've got. They'll send you the selection of different kinds of steaks, ground beef. You're going to get your chicken breast and you have meat for a few weeks, depending how big your family is. It's fantastic. So use the code Lila for $30 off your first order at GoodRanchers.com. You're going to love it. Let me know what you think, but I'm really excited because this is a company that is family-run, shares our values, is focused on American ranchers, American farmers, and has the best quality meat we've had all year. GoodRanchers.com. 
Well, on the podcast today, we have Robert Nicholson, the founder and head of the Philos Project here, to weigh in with his expertise about what is unfolding right now in Israel and in Gaza. Robert, thank you so much for joining the joining the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. So first of all, for those that don't know your work, I've heard great things about it. We have a mutual friend. I wanted to understand, let's start with your expertise and your background and your work with the Philos Project. Sure. Well, I am the founder and president of this organization based in New York City, the Philos Project. Our mission is to promote positive Christian engagement in the Near East. We could talk more about that. We started in 2014. It was the product of my own spiritual journey, you could say, none of it planned. And this was a journey that uh, started with me questioning religion. I was not a religious person, uh, very anti-Christian, uh, having kind of re rejected, rebelled against uh, some of the things I was taught as a child. Um, and then after 9-11, realizing that, wow, religion, even if I think it's stupid, is really important for billions of people, and I should probably know something about it. Mm -hmm. And that led me to reading the Quran, the the book of Osama bin Laden, and the book and the Bible, the book of uh, President Bush, and that really was the the start of a journey that led me to realize there's um, much more of a connection between my faith, Christianity, and uh, the Middle East than I had thought. Right? Actually, this was not an American religion or European religion. This is a this is a Middle Eastern religion that went on to change the world. And I've been on a journey ever since then to try to figure out what that means. What does it mean, not just in terms of my own mm -hmm. spiritual sense of self, but my responsibilities, my, my connection to the people that we're going to talk about here on this show, people who live in this part of the world today, um, for, for sure the Jewish people as the originators of, of Christianity, you could say, uh, Jesus, of course, being being very Jewish, but also other people that li live in this part of the world, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, and otherwise. And so that's really how everything got started. I, I learned Hebrew when I got degrees and all the things I could get degrees in. And lo and behold, in the end, I'm, I'm starting this organization. Amazing. And you have, you've like you said, you have degrees in Middle Eastern um, area. Of your, that's kind of an area that you've studied at length. You just said you studied Hebrew. Tell us a little bit about your um, educational background. And I think you, have, you, you also have taught on Middle Eastern issues. That's correct. I, I, well, I started in community college once upon a time. I got a humanities <laughs> degree, an associate's degree. I'm very proud of. That was actually the hardest degree to get. You know, go for, Going from zero to one <laughs> is much harder than one to ten. Good, good uh, community on, college, it sounds like. <laughs> it was great. Some of my best professors were at this community college. I'm a huge community college mm. proponent. Yeah. Uh, went on to uh, SUNY Binghamton. Uh, SUNY is the uh, mm. the state school system in New York State. I'm from I'm from Syracuse, by the way. I didn't mention that originally. And mm. uh, went there, got a degree, double degree in um, Hebrew studies and in history. And then went and got a law degree from Syracuse University, as well as a master's from there in uh, Middle Eastern history. Well, tell us, start, I mean, the weekend just unfolded. We're doing this interview. Uh, we'll probably be released at the end of this week. We're doing this interview on Monday, October 9th. So we're just coming out of the events of the weekend where just unprecedented attacks, I think, in Israel's history. It's the single largest uh, day of civilian deaths in Israel's history, to my understanding, ha unfolded over the weekend after terrorists that are Hamas-led entered border towns, um, killed uh, I think it's the death toll is seven or eight hundred people now. Uh, many of them families, children. Uh, you know, not these are not civilians, non-combatants, and then also took hostage. I think 150 Israelis. It's unprecedented. Give us a little background here for people who maybe have heard about the conflict ongoing in Gaza and Israel, but the events. I know it's a it's a long history, but help people understand the context here of the events that unfolded over the weekend. Sure. Uh, I'll start with uh, what happened in brief. You said a lot of it there. Um, 6.30 in the morning on Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, day of rest. Uh, Hamas, this uh, terrorist organization that controls the Gaza Strip, uh, where two million Palestinians live next door to Israel, launches a, an attack. First rockets and then fighters coming in uh, by foot, 
coming over the fence, through the fence, uh, by sea in boats, and believe it or not, by hang glider, landing inside Israel, penetrating up to 15 miles inside the country, uh, infiltrating over 20 towns, villages, cities, just towns and villages like yours and mine, and going house to house, door to door, um, doing some of the most unspeakable things that really anyone could ever imagine, killing parents in front of the kids, kids in front of the parents, raping people there in front of their loved ones, taking people um, back as hostages to the Gaza Strip. Uh, there are now, as, as you said, it's more than actually 700. This is now on, on Monday. We're at 900. No doubt those numbers will go up. Thousands maimed, hundreds in critical condition. And these 100 and I've heard 30, I've heard 50, who are being held hostage are really the big concern because where are they? They're taken back into residential areas in the Gaza Strip. There's no like prisoner of war camp. This, they, they purposely hide these hostages among civilians, knowing that the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, are going to have a very hard time finding them and then getting them out. Just the biggest trauma that's ever happened to the state of Israel in 50 years. Like people said, this is Israel's 9-11. It's that, but it's actually more than that because per capita, if you do the math, we're talking about uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 9 11s, right? This is the level of shock. Now, as far as how we got here, it is a, it is a very long story. Um, I'll try to be somewhat succinct about it. Um, the idea that Jews would go back to their homeland and... Uh, you know, be free, be safe, came about as a result of the experience they had in Europe uh, from Christians, from post-Christians, people who, for whatever reason, theology or blood or jealousy said, you don't belong here, we don't want you here. And finally, Jews, a small number of them at first in the 1870s, 1880s said, you know what, maybe we should take them at their word. Maybe we don't belong here. Maybe we should go back to where we're from. And they started to. And in the beginning, this was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. They just moved back and bought property, bought houses, start, you know, planted orchards, the regular things one does when one moves to a new town. Everything changed when the British took over, defeated the Ottomans in World War I, took over this land, and for reasons maybe we can go into, if you like, decided to support, as a matter of policy, the return of Jews to their homeland. And this, of course, created a... A, a source of deep bitterness in the Arab world, uh, the, the, the Muslim world, uh, which believes that whether for Arab national reasons or Islamic religious reasons, that there can be no such thing as a Jewish state and certainly not in the land of Palestine. Now, although there was never a state of Palestine, it just never existed. It was like a, it's kind of like saying New England, it was a region, wasn't really, uh, you know, organized in any way. These, uh, the Arab states from the very beginning were determined to destroy the state of Israel and uh, reestablish an Arab uh, state on top of it. There were several offers in the 30s and 40s to create two states for two peoples, one Arab, one Jewish. The Arab state, by the way, was, was much bigger. And the uh, United Nations voted on this plan in 1947 and said, this is a good idea. We support it. The nations of the world come together. Uh, Jews were, were thrilled. A recognition from the world, almost 2,000 years after being expelled by the world's greatest empire. Uh, now a recognition that this is, this is approved. This is something that the world wants to see. The day after, the Arabs, both local and in the region, uh, waged war. And that was the way it was. War after war. And... Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that the first Arab state, Egypt, made peace with Israel. Uh, in the 1990s, Palestinians finally agreed to recognize that there was such a thing called Israel and decided, okay, we won't destroy it. That won't be our doctrine anymore. We'll try to negotiate with it. And um, there, were, there, were, uh, there was a real exciting moment in the 1990s, 1993, 1994. It really felt, and I remember these days, I was young. But I remember there was a feeling that this big thing, this Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's about to get sorted out, right? Palestinians and Jews and Israelis are, are meeting. They're shaking hands. It was unthinkable, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. 
And, and then uh, this group called uh, Hamas came into the picture. Hamas was formed in the late 80s, early 90s. And they were committed as a matter of doctrine, right, dogma, to the destruction of the state of Israel and the um, expulsion of, of Jews, which also is a point of doctrine. They believe are descendants of apes and pigs. And this is them talking, not me. And they derailed a lot of things and eventually uh, began committing bombings, suicide attacks. And um, finally, Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip completely, pulled up its Jewish settlers who had been living there forcibly, you know, po Israeli police in uniforms pulling out Jews from the Gaza Strip and basically handed the keys over to the, the newly created Palestinian Authority and said, like, you know, let's consider this a, a, a sign of good faith. This, this is now yours, and let's do more of this. Unfortunately, Hamas won the Palestinian elections, took over the Gaza Strip, and from that day to this has done whatever it could with the help of the Islamic Republic of Iran to act out its agenda and to destroy the state of Israel. That's a very abbreviated version of the history. Well done. I know it's a, a very lengthy history. What are the origins of Hamas? You said it originated only a few decades ago. What are the origins of Hamas? And how did they come to rule over two million uh, Palestinians, including some Palestinian Christians in the Gaza Strip? That's a great question. So Hamas is actually a franchise, believe it or not. It is an extension, an hmm. iteration of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I'm sure people have heard <laughs> the term the Muslim Brotherhood. This was an organization started in Egypt and then later spread around the Islamic world, which was dedicated to, uh, let's say, Islamic reform of revival, even uh, Islamic revival, but revival nonetheless. And it started very small. It was um, local community centers and after school programs and, you know, quote unquote, Bible studies, Quran studies for for men. And the strategy was to change Islamic society from the ground up, to get everybody revived so that they could topple these corrupt Arab leaders and install what the Quran and their tradition called them to do, which is to install an Islamic state of some kind, right? There's a feeling in the Arab world that the reason we're losing to the West, the reason these Zionists, these Jews were able to defeat us in the war of 1948 is because it's, it's actually similar to what a lot of Christians do in moments of crisis. It's like, we got to get our, we got to get our hearts right. We got to get our lives right before Allah. And only then will he bless us. And that was the Muslim brotherhood. Um, some uh, aspects of it were extremely violent. There are different factions that emerged and all of it, however, is dedicated to, I would say, Islamic supremacy, right? There can be no Christian sovereignty, no Jewish sovereignty. All peoples need to be ruled by Muslims. Now, Hamas was an offshoot of that, the same ideology. Um, by the way, the same ideology that inspired Osama bin Laden in the beginning. Hmm. And they localized it. This was Hamas started as the Palestinian hmm. chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood. And if anyone has any interest in, in understanding this group on its own terms, I'd urge them just go online, Google Hamas Charter, and you'll see the founding document of this organization. And I can promise you, uh, spoiler alert, that you will be shocked and, and horrified by the, by the things that this organization uh, believes. In the beginning, they were nobody. Nobody took them seriously. But as the, the secular leaders of the Palestinian people continued to make mistake after mistake and failed to deliver on the national dreams, this uh, Islamic movement told the people, we can do better. And over time, together with the acts of terrorism that they, that they committed, showing that they can be bold, that they can actually strike fear in the hearts of Jews, they gained more and more market share until they won that election in uh, 2006. Unfortunately, their numbers are even higher today. What kind of uh, approval ratings or how many votes, you know, what kind of majority vote did they win in, the, in Gaza? Well, they won, it wasn't only in Gaza, they won the, uh, the plurality of the vote 
it, that stretch between Palestinians of Gaza and the West Bank. And uh, the number I do not have uh, on me at the moment, but uh, they won, which was which was a big uh, slap in the face for not only the the mainstream Palestinian leadership, then ruled by well the current ruler, this guy named Mahmoud Abbas, but also the U.S. President George Bush, who had pushed pushed really hard yeah. for elections. If you remember that time. Lila, that was, you know, democracy and we're going to get everybody free. And there was this feeling that the Palestinians wanted to be as free as anyone. And if you give them the opportunity to vote, they'll vote for for freedom. Um, We didn't recognize because of the cultural gap between the Near East and the West that uh, religion actually matters for people in this part of the world. Right. There's not always an inner Thomas Jefferson just kind of waiting to come out. Uh, in these moments, and the people actually do vote according to conscience, according to their beliefs, their traditions, right. things they've been raised with, and that's why uh, Hamas won. And like I said, there was a there's a great organization called the Palestinian Center for Survey and Policy Research, uh, PCPSR, I believe. You can find them online. The preeminent Palestinian polling firm based in Ramallah, and every right. month, sometimes every few weeks, they track public opinion numbers. Like today, do you support? Hamas's acts against, uh, you know, Jews in Israel, civilians in Israel. They ask all of these questions and you can get actual numbers uh, from all of those documents. They publish them online. What is Palestinian sentiment right now about the attacks against Israel by Hamas over the weekend? Well, it's it's hard to say because I'm not there. I can tell you what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Um, Naturally, we've seen many images disturbing um, if they were not so common, of Palestinians celebrating, uh, not just in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. This is this is uh, usually what you see after these kinds of attacks, passing out candies and dancing in the streets and all these sorts of things. Uh, there are no doubt Palestinians who are horrified and, and repulsed by what they've seen. Uh, unfortunately, they will not be able to be, to be speaking out, right? If there's one thing... Mm-hmm. You understand in the in the Arab world, and I would say in the greater Islamic world, is that you know dissent has no place, right? Whoever's in charge makes the rules, and your best bet is just to keep your head down and be quiet. We know from polling data, that same polling data I was referring to, that uh, and it goes up and down. When you ask Palestinians, you know, do you support armed struggle or diplomacy mm-hmm. and negotiations? questions like that you usually get it depends on the time it goes it goes up and down but anywhere from 10 15 to 30 percent or more of palestinians saying giving the kinds of answers that maybe you and i would give right um there are good guys in there but they are they are terrified right and and they are frustrated they're frustrated with their leadership. There has not been an election, by the way, since that one that happened uh, now almost 20 years ago. The same guys are wow. in power, the same corrupt establishments are in power. If you look at the, the, the approval ratings of their own president, that's really all you need to know. I'm talking about upwards of 80% disapproval. Like, please so go no away. So no election. There was, one, there was one election a couple decades ago that elected Hamas basically terrorists. I mean, many of them ultimately now committing acts of terror. And since then, uh, surprise, surprise, no no other election has been held with the opportunity to even root them out of power. That's right. Well, it even it's even worse than that because these two territories, the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip, for those people who've seen the map, right? There's Israel, West Bank, Gaza, the latter two being Palestinian territories. Those two territories are now controlled by two rival Palestinian factions. There was a an actual battle, a small war in 2007, in which Hamas forced out the mainstream uh, Fatah party. It's, I don't want to get in the weeds, but the other the other faction forced them out of Gaza, set up shop. Now they rule that. So you have two Palestinian states essentially. You have the Palestinian Authority that controls the West Bank or most of it, and you have Hamas, which controls the Gaza Strip, and they hate each other. And and efforts over the <laughs> years by Arab states, by, the, by others to, to broker some kind of relationship have, have all 
failed. So you have this extra layer where if any effort to make peace runs into the buzzsaw of Palestinian political realities, right? Like, who are you making peace with? Obviously, Hamas is dedicated in principle to your destruction. And the other side, if you make peace with it, that peace is not a real peace because the other side is not going to respect it. It's super complex. Give us a little... Give us a little um, understanding here. So the population of Israel versus the population of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So how many individuals are we dealing with? And then you also said that it's, you know, maybe 10 to up to 30 percent of Palestinians don't like the leadership, are sympathetic maybe to the crimes against the Jewish people, wish for more freedom. And so I'm, I'm looking to kind of understand the demographics here and for folks in the United States to understand who really are in agreement with the leadership versus not. Yes, those are all very tricky questions. Um, I would so in terms of the numbers, so you have two million people mm-hmm. in Gaza, Palestinians, all, the Christians have all but fled by now. There's a couple hundred, very, okay. very small community, uh, as you can imagine, pretty, pretty tough place to live if you're a Christian. It's an Islamic state. Uh, it's just what it is. Um, Palestinians in general are 1% of, as you were, Christians are 1% of the Palestinian people, just to give you a sense. <laughs> um, the West Bank has more. The West Bank, I believe the numbers are, you hear different things, 4 million, something like that. Um, m- maybe a little bit less. Uh, Israel, the, the I think the last numbers I saw, it's over 8 million um, 20% of which is Arab. So a lot of people don't realize there are Arab Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza, but there are also uh, 20% of Israel's citizens are, are Arabs, essentially Palestinians, who are you know just citizens. They vote, they have political parties, they're just part of, part of Israel. So that, that uh, blurs the lines uh, a little bit. Public Square is the Yelp for people that share your values. So if you want to find 75,000 businesses that are pro-life, pro-family, pro-freedom, you can download the free Public Square app today and browse the businesses that actually support your values. Why continue to patronize and go and shop at businesses that are opposed to pro-life values, that are opposed to the family? Instead, you can find those businesses, children's clothing companies, household product companies, makeup companies for the ladies, any of these products and more, many more can be found at the free Public Square app. So download Public Square today for free at the link in the bio and browse America's freedom-loving, family-loving companies. 31 Harvard groups, this came out over the weekend. I think it was amazing how quickly they responded to the attacks on Israel. And so 31 student groups, student organizations from Harvard all made this announcement. And I want to get your response to this, Robert. They said, today's events did not occur in a vacuum. For the last two decades, millions of Palestinians in Gaza specifically have been forced to live in an open air prison. Israeli officials promised to open the gates of hell and the massacres in Gaza have already commenced. And then they go on to say that what's happening in Israel is fully the responsibility of Israel, meaning the attacks by Hamas terrorists on innocent men, women, and children in Israel, the butchery, is Israel's fault. And these are American, you know, many of them American students in, um, in at a, you know, one of our most prestigious universities in America. What's your response to that? Uh, par for the course. This problem inside the American Academy of radical ideologies running rampant and not only allowed to continue but even in some strange way encouraged is uh something that unfortunately has gotten worse in the last couple of years and is going to continue to get worse if left unchecked these are people uh, for whom the state of israel the only jewish state in the world in a tiny little thing israel's small it's the size of new jersey you'd think the way people talk about it it's you know the size of China. It's very tiny. If you go there, you'll realize, wow, this is a little itty bitty country. For these people, mm. that country is, in some sense, the embodiment of everything that they hate about Western civilization, right? Palestinians, even like the good ones. This is an important point. I don't think a lot of people know. Um, repeat a narrative in their media, in their schools, that the Jews of Israel are not actually Jews. 
they are pretend Jews, maybe people who converted, some kind of Turkish tribe in the Middle Ages that converted and came under the auspices of the U.S. and Britain and France and the West to colonize the Arab world and drive a wedge between Muslims, um, you know, East and West. There is, I've been told to my face by very senior members of not only the Palestinian political establishment, but the religious establishment, that there is no such thing as a Jewish temple. There was never a temple in Jerusalem. It doesn't exist. It's a big lie used by the West to create this forward operating base in the middle of the, the Arab and Islamic world. Now, people at Harvard may not go that far, but in defending this group, Hamas, they are buying in to the wholesale dehumanization of not just the Jews in Israel, but the Jewish people overall. And they mm -hmm. are, I mean, I'll state the obvious, they are defending the most repugnant kind of human behavior that exists on this planet. These are educated people, but they are people who are, I would say, sworn, whether they can articulate it in these terms or not, to the destruction of uh, the Judeo-Christian heritage. For them, Israel, the United States, the West represents all that is bad in the world. It all, it's all part of a piece, needs to be dismantled, and needs to be replaced. When I read the things that come out of a place like Harvard, these kinds of statements, that's where uh, I think it all comes from. It's deeper. It's not the Jews. Nobody really, they don't care about Palestinians. They, what have they done? When's the last time they went to Gaza and volunteered, right? The people who claim, who meet me and came to claim to care about Palestinians, for the most part, I'm speaking anecdotally now, they could care less. They're not going to go online and Google any Palestinian opinion surveys. They're not interested. What they're interested in is using the Palestinians as pawns, as pretexts for this larger struggle against the establishment, right? The West and all of what comes with that. That's my view. So you're, so you're saying it, you're saying it's not just anti-Semitism. It's actually anti anything that's a Western ideal of, you know, a Judeo and ultimately Christian value, a principle. So it's a you know, it's a reaction against our basic values and ideals about humans having uh, human rights and humans having religious liberty. And there's a God who's a creator that that's what's at the deepest level going on here when Harvard students come out and protest and write against Israel at a moment when they're being absolutely savaged. Yes, it's it's I'm sure for some people uh, quite a reach. Wow, really, man? You go from, you know, the Harvard letter to, you know, sworn enemy of Judeo-Christian uh, civilization? Yes, I do. I think as, as people of faith, we always need to be operating at two levels at the same time. There's the material world. We need to take it seriously. People do, in fact, need jobs, care about their families, want to go to good hospitals. But we also can't forget there is a spiritual dimension, right? People believe things, and these things are extremely important to them, to their sense of identity, both as individuals and as societies. And they do things, they act on those beliefs, often to their own detriment. They'll give their lives for mm -hmm. these beliefs. Um, and they will kill, they will kill people for these beliefs. And I don't think we've sufficiently zoomed out when we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We see it through a straw. We think it's about borders. We think it's about, you know, lines on a map and, uh, okay, what's the right, you know, amount of refugees that could, I could, I, if I had enough time, I, I could recount for you all the many opportunities in the timeline when this conflict could have been ended, when the Jews, a small people who has no interest in having more war, extended Olive Branch after Olive Branch. Hey, what about this? Can we compromise on that? and were rejected time after time, leaving them with, especially in these last few days, the feeling that they're never going to accept us. If they, you know, we agree to that, we disengage from Gaza, we say, here's the keys, it's yours, we're not gonna be there anymore, you're still gonna come after us for some other reason. And if we leave <laughs> Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, you're gonna then come at us in Tel Aviv, like it's never 
going to be enough. That's the feeling on the street where, in Israel. Where do they want them to go? I mean, if Hamas had their way, I mean, they'd want to destroy the Jewish people. I think it's part of, like you said, their charter. But let's say if a more moderate um, Palestinian state advocate had their way, where are the Jewish people to go? So there are different tracks. So there is one group, let's say the topmost group, the most uh, formally the most rational, right? The, the group that, that leads the, the Palestinian Authority right now from Ramallah. The answer would be that we are going to create a two-state solution. Jews can stay in Israel. Any Jews, these settlers, uh, you know, the, the boogeyman of these settlers, um, any of those need to be ex expelled from Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. They can go back to Israel, but we'll live side by side somehow. That's the basic paradigm for, for that group. Um, the, the other extreme is um, Hamas, which is the total eradication of the Jewish state. And there are two, two ways you can go with that. One is that you Jews can stay so long as we're in charge. We rule you and you obey the new law of the land, you know, you're more than welcome. And then there are others who say they all have to go. This, this place needs to be free of all Jews because it is, um, it is an Islamic waqf. It's like religious property, the same way the Arabian Peninsula is not allowed to have churches, right? It needs to be clean of these uh, kind of un-Islamic influences. That's another, another uh, track that some of them go. I want to get back to in a minute the allegations, all the narratives against Israel that are all over American media. I mean, you see it in mainstream media, and we're going to get to that. But before that, I want to go back to what happened over the weekend. You gave a very high-level synopsis at the beginning of explaining the context of what's happening in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But there are a couple things that I think are so heart-wrenching that many people are keeping keeping people up at night who care about what's happening to uh, Israeli victims. So I want to go to that. So first of all, uh, you, I think you said the death tolls now 900. It sounds like they're still finding bodies in they these are. village areas. I just saw a news article that there's an entire rural village that they just discovered that's been completely wiped out. They're going home to home and men, women and children slaughtered. Um, can you share more about the tactic that Hamas took in uh, entering these settlements and these village border towns? and why they were able to be as successful as they uh, were. My understanding of Israel's uh, foreign defense and their defense um, system is that it's very strong. You know, they have the Iron Dome, they've been, their intelligence forces are some of the best in the world. How did it happen that they uh, were able, Hamas was able to scale the, the walls, so to speak, and kill so many innocent people? Sure. Um, that's a big question and one that will be debated quite a bit in the, in the days and weeks to come to go back to the, you know, the, the, what they, um, their tactics in crossing over. I mentioned the, the air, sea and land method of incursion. Uh, I didn't mention that before that happened, they, in a very coordinated and uh, careful way, uh, through rockets, through drones took out. Uh, some of Israel's, um, let's say, security equipment along the border, cameras and sensors and things like that, which uh, suggests or, or confirms that this was no no act of, you know, random malice. This was coordinated, planned for months, and importantly, and this is a, a piece a lot of people are are leaving out because they are looking at it through a straw. Uh, this was all directed from from Tehran, right? Hamas is funded, equipped, trained, directed in large part by uh, the Iranian regime, which of course is sworn to Israel's destruction. And, ha and that regime has an, a massive intelligence capability and technical capability that allowed them to get the jump essentially on, um, on the IDF. They, they crossed the border, however, and had no real plan, at least uh, that I've been able to see. No doubt they broke up into different groups and they all kind of went in different directions, but they were seizing targets of opportunity. The biggest and, and maybe the most horrific 
example of that was when a bunch of fighters stumbled upon a giant rave that was taking place uh, in the desert. Hundreds of people there at, at a big music festival. It was, a, it was actually a peace festival, believe it or not. And um, target of opportunity. They went into the crowd and began, uh, you know, killing and, and even more disturbingly raping uh, many of the people in this in this uh, concert before moving on to the next target. They ju- and in some places they were roaming, Lila, roaming around the countryside for hours. Now, how did that happen? This is the big question. How in the world did the IDF, as you said, one of the best militaries in the world, not know that this was going to happen? There's already a lot of commentary on this. I'm going to try to avoid getting into the weeds, and who knows by the time listeners hear this episode what's transpired but it's very clear that this was a massive intelligence failure one of the biggest in israel's history reminiscent of a war that took place uh, between egypt and syria and israel in 1973 the the yom kippur war Uh, there's actually a great movie out about that right now golda i think it's out streaming Um, uh, and there's no doubt going to be many uh, political ramifications for the prime minister, for his government, as people ask this question, what the heck, how did this, how did this happen? How did intelligence not pick it up? Of course, this did take place on a Jewish holy day on the Sabbath in the midst of, at the Mm. very end of the Jewish high holidays. You know, you could almost think of it as like Christmas season for Christians, right? There's just, we're a lot going on. We're all busy. We're in holiday mode. And then it's like just about the time when we're like coming back online at the beginning of January. That was the moment that that they struck so it was it was a sleepy time it was a quiet time i do think that um there was a lot of i'm sure some some listeners were following a little bit of the political debate in israel over the last nine months there's been a lot of internal debate over the legal system and the political system israelis were were frankly a little bit distracted and i think in the aftermath of a few other peace deals that Israel's made in the last couple of years with a few Arab states, these Abraham Accords, as they call them. There was a feeling that, you know, we're actually in a good spot right now. Palestinians, more or less quiet, at least in Gaza. There was a lot of violence over the summer in the West Bank, and that was kind of where their attention, the IDF's attention was focused, but more or less under control, not a strategic threat. We're worried about Iran, but, you know, like we're working on it. And the idea that out of Gaza, of all places, there would be this kind of incursion um, at that scale was clearly not something that anyone was prepared for. So do you think that the hostage is taken? So as an example, that you mentioned the music festival for peace, and there's hundreds of these young people dancing early in the morning, and all of a sudden they're being massacred unexpectedly, like out of a, a complete nightmare some of those festival attendees were kidnapped, are now hostages. As you said earlier, there's 130, maybe 150 hostages, including little babies. I mean, there's a viral treat going around of two little ones, their mother, uh, an image of her being shoved through the street by Hamas terrorists, and she's holding her two sons, a a three-month-old and a three-year-old. And they're all, you know, hostages now. Do you think that these roving Hamas groups that are committing these heinous acts once they scaled the border, were they taking random hostages? What, do you mm. think there was a plan, a strategy? We need at least 100 hostages because this is going to help us with our demands against Israel. Why were some people taken hostage and others not? That's a very good question. I don't know that I have a good answer. I'll, I'll hazard a guess. I don't think there was a, a great plan apart from we need as many hostages as possible. Uh, you have to remember, if you're thinking historically, uh, Palestinians know that Israelis will do anything, almost anything anyway, to get not only a, a one hostage back, but the body of a hostage back, mm. right? Israel, because of uh, Judaism and the biblical heritage, takes life very seriously. One life is, is, is as if it's the whole world. And... Palestinians know that if you can get hostages, you can trade them for things, right? Get get Palestinian uh, buddies released from 
uh, Israeli prisons. You know, these are terrorists convicted of, of murder and, and other things. Um, and also political demands, right? If you have a lot of Israelis, you can do a lot. That's a, that's a real bargaining chip. Um, and the Palestinians know that. And so the order was get as many as possible. Um, I do think that if you look at some of the photos, and I've, and I've seen now uh, quite a few of the missing people, there is, it seems to be uh, heavily women. Um, mm. I can only speculate. And children. To, I mean, I've seen images children. Of, of children, too. Lots of children, very young, as you mentioned, like little kids, um, some men, but it does seem that there was a, a real concerted effort to to find the weak, the people who, of course, will stir the heartstrings of Israel and, and make it, you know, do things uh, that are in the Palestinians' interests. There was a New York Times headline just an hour ago that says Israel orders siege of Gaza. Hamas threatens to kill hostages. Um, it sounds like Hamas is threatening that they will kill one hostage for every attack, as they say, and on a and anytime there's an Israeli airstrike that hits Gazans in their homes. What's going on here? I, I mean, well, whether they will follow through on that threat is uncertain, because, of course, if, if you believe what I just said, the, this is their most important bargaining chip. Do you really want to execute them? You know. God forbid I'd be an advisor to Hamas, I would say, don't do that. That's not a smart play. Um, but they're certainly capable of it. They've done much worse already. They have no respect for human life, or let's just say when human life uh, comes up against their, their dogma, human life becomes secondary. And so I have every reason to believe that they will act on that, which of course puts Israel in an extremely difficult position. How do you how do you respond when they have your people spread out through densely populated residential areas and um, do so while minimizing the collateral damage also for Palestinian civilians? It's extremely this is this is a challenge that Israel in, in, in the many confrontations it's had, I don't think has ever faced. This is at a whole different level. And I pity the person who's making decisions right now. There's accusations. I mean, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. So you have these big kind of lefty groups that claim to be for human rights, many of which are pro-abortion, uh, as well as pro-transing young children and, and other atrocities. But some of these groups uh, write up these reports on how Israel is a human rights abuser. Israel is committing apartheid against apartheid against uh, innocent Palestinians. And really, I mean, they have a whole lit litany of sins that they say Israel has committed. And you have, you know, these um, people that say, well, you know, Israel is now threatening to launch attacks against um, Hamas. And now they're saying, you know, you should leave if you are a Palestinian, if you can get out, get out now, if you're an innocent woman, an innocent child. But that this is insincere from Israel, that this is virtue signaling because there's no way to leave uh, the Gaza Strip. There's no way for those innocent people to get out. What's what's really going on here? Israel is far and away the army, uh, its army is, is the one that I've encountered that's the most interested in ethics. Every soldier, the lowliest private, gets a robust training in the spirit of the IDF and its commitment mm -hmm. to minimizing any civilian casualties to the point of, this is kind of a famous uh, example, uh, Israel, before it bombs a building, will send text messages to the people who live in the building to, to please, please get out. We're about to do something. They have a certain, and I'm not even sure how this works technically, they have a certain bomb before the bomb. It's basically like a giant rock that will hit the Seriously. roof of a building to let people know you got five minutes, get out, because we're about to do something. I don't know of the American military of which I was a part, uh, or any other military that takes that kind of um, precautionary measures. Israel goes hmm. way, way, way out of its way to, to be as careful as possible. There are ways for civilians. The Gaza Strip isn't just one city. There, it's, a, it's a strip. There's a whole area. There are ways to get out of heavily populated urban areas into rural areas outside the cities. So the idea that nobody can go anywhere, that everyone is just stuck and, and must die, 
is, I think, an exaggeration. Having said that, has, has the Israeli military ever made a mistake? Well, yeah. Do soldiers do things that are repugnant, that are um, atrocities themselves? There have been instances of them. And those soldiers have been uh, properly tried and, and put in jail. That's the difference between uh, Israel and, and mm. some of these other countries. So while I am perfectly you know, happy conceding that there are some bad apples and that um, things have happened, uh, I, I, I really don't understand how anyone could look at what Israel's done in Gaza, in the West Bank, and say that they've done anything but uh, try to be careful. I mean, imagine, Lila, imagine there is a, an enclave of, of people committed to your destruction next door to you, like actually next door. These towns are not that far apart. Uh, in America, let's just say, there was a little enclave of, of people sworn to the destruction of America and doing their hardest to, to act out that wish. What would we do? We would, we would decimate it. We would eradicate it. It wouldn't exist. It would be a parking lot. The fact that Israel, almost 20 years after Hamas took power in the Gaza Strip, still basically lets Hamas live and conduct business and receive diplomats from around the world, even helps those diplomats go through the checkpoints. And I mean, there's so many stories uh, that show that Israel is, I think, far better than the U.S. in this regard and um, is just looking for an opportunity to, to reach some sort of final resolution, right? There, there's, Israel has no interest in occupying and colonizing. Like, there's nothing in uh, the Israeli interest that says, you know, I want to take over Gaza and two million Palestinians who hate me. Like, why would they want to do that? It's it's just absurd. I, but I think it, it usually comes from people who just don't know Israelis. There's this perception of who uh, Israelis are and what they want. And, and, and then there's the actual people. And I know enough actual people to know that it's just a very different story. I, it sounds like it's rampant anti-Semitism. I mean, you look at what happened to the Jewish people in the last century. I mean, uh, unprecedented horrors, the Holocaust, and the the ways that they were destroyed in, in, in living in Europe. And that anti-Semitism was not that long ago, you know, the, the consequence of it. So I think there's a, we're so quick, I feel, to forget our history uh -huh. and to forget our weakness. You know, in the, in the Western world, this was the Western world committing the Holocaust. This was Germany. This wasn't, uh, you know, this wasn't an Islamic nation even. This was, you know, Germany. And so, yes, of course, you're going to see anti-Semitism among Hamas and the hatred of the Jews, calling them, you know, subhuman. But that subhuman hatred is, has existed uh -huh among nations that possessed many Christians, not just people of I Islamic tradition. That's a very powerful point, and I'm glad you mentioned that. It's very easy for us mm -hmm. to sit in judgment over Arabs, Muslims, but we forget, as you said, that we are the reason. I think I would go this far. We are the reason <laughs> that Jews are in Israel, right? They were not trying Cheers. to go back to their homeland. That was something that the Messiah will come someday and he'll, he'll figure it out and he'll bring us all back and it'll be amazing. But day to day were Jews trying to go back and colonize whatever. They had no interest for the most part until events reached a fever pitch in Europe, right? By the way, there were Jews in both Europe, the Christian world, and in the Middle East, in the, in the Islamic world. Which Jews felt so persecuted that they needed to go establish a homeland. It was from Europe, right? Jews from the Muslim world were affected yeah. kind of secondarily and ended up being pushed out of those countries and they had to find refuge in Israel. But the real, I mean, where does Zionism come from? It comes from the Western rejection of the Jewish people as equal members of our societies. That's where it comes from. Now, we, 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 put, that, we put that problem now on the Islamic world and... Muslims of different kinds are, are reacting and, and uh, you know, building their plans uh, in different ways. But the problems, the problem started with us, which is why I think we as, as Westerners and specifically as Christians have 
an outsized responsibility not to, by the way, let me just be clear, not to say Israel was let down from heaven on a, on a sheet and like the Israeli, you know, political system or all of its laws are somehow from, you know, from God. This is not, this is not what we're saying, but recognizing that they're there for a reason. They are a people and as a people, they deserve to be in their homeland. And most of all, they deserve to be safe. They just want to be left alone. And I think that we uh, really have the obligation to be the, f the preeminent advocates for that position. Hey. And that's, that's something I do a lot in the work uh, of the Feetless Project. Our sponsor today is Seven Weeks Coffee. Just had my cup of coffee this morning from Seven Weeks. Sevenweekscoffee.com is gourmet organic coffee that is really the best coffee. The, the roasts are delicious. I drink Ethiopia medium. This morning I was drinking the Faith Blend and I loved that. It was smooth and balanced and delicious and it's what I start my day with. Seven Weeks Coffee is a pro-life coffee, coffee company. So they give back 10% of all their money, not just profit, their revenue to pro-life pregnancy centers. So when you buy Seven Weeks Coffee, you're not only enjoying a great start to your morning with a great cup of coffee, but you are also supporting the pro-life movement directly. So if you haven't already, or if you need your refill, go to sevenweekscoffee.com, order that delicious uh, bag of coffee, use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. A uh, American commentator, Guy Benson, said recently over the weekend on Twitter, when Palestinian children are wounded or killed, it's despite Israel's efforts to avoid civilian casualties while fighting terrorists who intentionally operate among innocents. When Israeli children are wounded or killed, they are explicitly targeted by the terrorists and many Palestinians openly celebrate zero moral equivalency. Well said. You mentioned Iran, and I want to just cover this for a minute because it's very connected to our uh, political leadership. Recently, our president, his administration unfroze, I think, six billion in Iranian assets. And there are, I, I think Trump uh, came out recently, you know, he's obviously running for president, but he came out saying that this is a direct result of that act action by President Biden. What, what do you think about that? I think it is at at the very least, an indirect result. This is a, unfortunately, long-standing policy of the U.S. government, certainly under the last two Democratic mm -hmm. administrations, uh, a policy of appeasement, a policy based on a desire on the part of many Americans to get out of the Near East, the Middle East, and to strike a deal with the baddest guys in the room, right? The Iranians. The Iranians are not some kind of ragtag force. They are a proper state, a big state, tens of millions of people, a real sense of history, a real sense of, of theology and ideology, and a very explicit commitment to the destruction of both Israel and the United States. Like this is talked about every day, all day long, in schools, on TV. I mean, this is, we don't have to like, hmm find evidence that this is what they want. This is what they want. Um, and the U S government has, uh, I think made many mistakes in backing down in caving in appeasing this, this bully. Like what, what does a bully do when you give in? He, he gets worse and the Iranians have gotten worse. And unfortunately this administration, hey seems intent on uh, deflecting and trying to uh, point out the, the value to better, better relations, better diplomacy with Iran, not, not, not admitting that it's, it's Iranian funding, it's Iranian strategy that is causing so many of the problems that we're seeing in the region, right? What about Christians in Northern Iraq? Who do you think is squeezing them out? What about the Christians in uh, northeastern Syria or other parts of Syria? What about in Lebanon, right? What about the people of Yemen, right? This is all part of of one giant strategy. And again, this is this is uh, this is official. This is something you could you could find online. And the United States government has been weak, has been. Um, willing to not only appease, but to 
apologize for uh, the Iranians. And we found out just a few weeks ago that this administration has allowed high-level Iranian agents, influence agents, to infiltrate, are you ready, the White House. Now, this is reporting that is out there. I, w- I would urge people to look it up. There's caused quite a bit of a, a, a storm the last few weeks as, these, as people found out just how um, deep the Iranian influence inside the U.S. government goes. So when I look at Hamas, when I look at Iraq, when I look at the poor Christians of Lebanon being squeezed out by Hezbollah, I don't see isolated situations that need these isolated treatments. I see, I see a grand chessboard that uh, right now the Iranians uh, are, you know, are holding and winning. And I think any response to what's happening in Israel and Gaza must mm-hmm. include a much more comprehensive response to the to the Iranian threat. I'm not calling for an invasion of Iran or anything like mm-hmm. that. That's not what I'm saying. But there needs to be real smart foreign policy that addresses the problem where it originates, which is in Tehran. What does that mean, Robert, when you say that there's reports that high-ranking Iranian officials have infiltrated our government? What does that mean? Well, it means that an organization that does research on these things was able to obtain a a large number of emails of various, um, let's call them experts and, and, and sort of policy people who the Biden administration has been using as its advisors. Right. Not and not in some, you know, uh, ancillary way, but but direct advisors, people very much involved in formulating U.S. policy on Iran. These emails revealed that not only are these people uh, pro Iran, but they in, in some cases very explicitly have pledged their their fealty to Ayatollah Khamenei. Right. These are these are people who are. Uh, being directed from the capital of one of our greatest enemies who are meeting in the White House repeatedly over and over. And I, have, I did not do this research. This research is out there. <laughs> um, if, you, if you look up uh, you know, Iranian influence agents, uh, U.S. government, you know, all of it will come up. A lot of commentary back and forth about what it means, how deep it goes. But uh, it's pretty clear at this point that uh, Iran's influence has extended all the way up to uh, the Oval Office. Shocking uh, in its scope, honestly. There have been uh, reports that un- an unprecedented number of um, undocumented immigrants are entering the United States right now, the southern border. We've basically stopped uh, stopping people at the border, and we are now just letting in mil- literally millions of people at the southern border. There's a lot of concerns that some of the people coming in certainly are you know, a real asylees seeking help, but that there are many bad actors coming in, including potential terrorists. Do you think that that's the case? And if so, do you think that the the terrorism that we just saw over the weekend in Israel, we can possibly expect to see more terrorist attacks here at home? The answer is yes. The southern border, uh, an issue I should say, full disclosure, I am no expert in, uh, seems, let's just say, very porous. There are people coming through. We don't know who they are, where they're coming from. It's been made very clear, as far as I can tell, that uh, most of these people are not from Mexico, which is, I think, what most people think. They're coming from other countries in Central and South America and other countries around the world. Um, yes, for sure, there are people coming through that would be um, sympathetic at the very least, with these kinds of acts of terrorism. But I would, I'd go even further than that, Lila. I was uh, yesterday, now this was Sunday, mm-hmm. the day after these horrible attacks in Israel, I was here in New York City at um, you know, a friendship solidarity event for the people of Israel and came face-to-face with what you know, has popped up in, in Western cities, both in, in the U.S. and in Europe, which are not people who snuck in, people who live here now, right? Maybe some of the same people that signed these statements uh, from Harvard who are also sympathetic uh, to what 
uh, these terrorist organizations want to do. And I think under certain circumstances would probably feel that they, um, you know, should do something to, you know, cripple the great Satan from within. I, I actually don't think you have to go all the way down to the southern border sure. to feel that there are people uh, in this country who are deeply invested in the idea that uh, this this country is a, is a cancer and needs to be needs to be changed. And that's a scary thought. You know, when you see these people and they're in. They're all over cities, all over the country, marching. I mean, can you imagine going out the day after these events, which are are com yes. they're visible to the whole world, right? It's not like you know, a hundred years ago, no one really knows what's happening. These are images that everyone can see, and you get your sign and your flag, and you go stand in a city square to defend these acts. I mean, I, Hamas, I, the brutal terrorists of Hamas. Listen, I, I, I find it unconscionable. I've seen the pro-Palestine. It's not just pro-Palestinian. You know, that's one thing to say. We have sympathy for innocents in Gaza or in the West Bank who may be caught up in war. I mean, that's, I think we can universally agree on that. But the hatred of Israel, you know, from, coming from, you know, Harvard student-led groups, the hatred of Israel playing out on these protests that are happening in New York, happening in cities across the country. It's, it is unfathomable when there are little babies, Jewish babies, who are taken hostage right now with knives to their throat, their captors using them as pawns after they've murdered friends and family in these, in these Israeli villages. It's unconscionable, and uh, I appreciate you acknowledging that. It's, it's crazy that we have to say that, right? We have to state the obvious, but these days, moral, moral clarity is, is at a premium, and I think it's on all people of conscience, Christians, no doubt, to be saying that and maybe having to repeat that because already, even in a few days since these attacks have come and gone, that, that narrative is shifting, right? Somehow now it's, it's Israel's fault. It's, it's, it's insane, but uh, this is what we're dealing with. There's so many news reports right now. I just have a couple more questions, but this is so, I mean, been so awesome, Robert. Thank you. Your expertise is really valuable here and your knowledge of, of the history and, and of the, uh, you know, of the dynamic. The media reports that I've noticed, I mean, some of them I find incredible. You have CBS News reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know, 1,300 dead. No note that this has been started necessarily by Hamas and that, you know, that, you know Hamas were the... Uh, you know, aggressors in this case and that of the dead, it's because largely Hamas has murdered uh, Israeli citizens. So, you you know, now this news on Instagram, they have a, a carousel. So there's a number of photos with the report. Their first, this was their first reporting, I think yesterday on, and millennials, many millennials and Gen Zers get their news through social media from now this news as an example. Their post, first time reporting on what happened in Israel, over 24 hours later, mind you, the first three images are of buildings or uh, of damage to structures done in Israel by Hamas. And then the next few images are of human beings, Palestinians, that uh. may be harmed or uh, are harmed by Israel. And the reporting says that there's this conflict that's now uh, ensuing. No word of the 250 young people slaughtered in cold blood in the desert by Hamas, no word of the children kidnapped, nothing about hostages, nothing, nothing about rape, nothing about those murdered in their beds, in their homes. What do you make of that? This, this incredible media bias from our own institutions. NPR is another one that I saw similarly misleading reporting. I, I think about this a lot. It comes up, unfortunately, quite a bit in my work. There, you have to go pretty far to find a dislike of a people so consistent over so many years in so many different places and under so many different circumstances. But whatever it is, there has been an inordinate amount of concern, um, dislike, hatred of of the Jewish people. I mean, it's just a fact of history. We talked about it in the Western world. We talked about it in the Islamic world. It's both, and it's not gone. It continues today. One of the things we do at the Philos Project is called the Philos Action League, and uh, we respond in the flesh, incarnationally, to acts of anti-Semitism in the United States. 
And I mentioned that because it was only when we launched that project about, I guess, say two years ago now, that I realized when we began tracking it just how much of this stuff is going on. It's happening on the left. It's happening on the right. And we have people who monitor these channels. And even as that stuff happens out there across the country and, of course, around the world, you see exactly what you said. You see the the you see that 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 trickle up effect in the media so that for whatever reason we can't explain it people are not interested in um the truth let's say living jews right people there's a great book that came out recently (laughs) by a friend of mine called people love dead jews which is a very provocative title uh, but if yeah. you read the book, she makes the case that for whatever reason, people, they like to talk about the Holocaust and, and you know, the synagogue massacre, this and that, um, and, you know, something that happened in Israel. But the idea that the response would be, well, then we need to protect the living Jews. We need to make sure that this, that the people of Israel are safe today and that maybe they're not always in the wrong. Maybe they're actually just trying to survive. It's just not uh, you know, that's not a step that a lot of people are willing to go. Personally, I'll, I'll go this far hmm. and I'll, I'll just lay my cards out. And I think I'm in good company uh, with uh, people who think in terms of the spirit. You know, we're always, we're always having to, you know, think of the physical world and the spiritual world at the same time. And I do think there is something about the Jewish people uh, that is deeply offensive to people who resent the tradition, the values, the scripture, the God that these people brought into the world, right? It's the one people. We talk about it in the Old Testament. We talk about it in the New Testament. They're chosen to play a unique role in history. doesn't mean they're better than everybody, but God chose to use them for, for his own reasons. And to that extent, they have been a kind of lightning rod for people who oppose God's revelation, who oppose uh, the Bible, who oppose the church, so that you find a situation where people who are enemies of the Jews are almost always enemies of of Christians, certainly in our days, right? (laughs) Hitler, for sure. Uh, You think about bin Laden, I mentioned him. You think about Hamas. These things in, in in, in the other's mind, they go together. Jews and Christians. And so what starts with the Jews always ends up coming to us. So why, why do you find Harvard students mad about, you know, the Western, you know, world and, you know, Christianity and Christian values and also, you know, mad at Israel? Well, because they go together. There's something about it and I can't fully explain it. I can't see the world as God sees it. Not yet, but there is something about this that is just, um, Hard to understand any other way. Hmm. I, I don't. I don't know that I can uh, say much more about that. But I've come to believe it more and more hmm. in doing this work all these years. I think it makes a lot of sense what you were saying, and it's a important, I think, challenge, especially to Christians to be allies of our Jewish brothers and sisters who are and have been for so long under persecution. Uh, It was NPR, actually. I saw earlier said now this news. They were also biased in their reporting, but specifically NPR, their very first post about what's happening in Israel, the atrocities, was this. At least 700 people have been killed in Israel and more than 2,000 wounded have been killed. Nothing about Hamas, nothing about terrorism, nothing nothing about how they were even killed. The The Gaza Health Ministry said more than 400 people have been killed in Gaza. So, you know, it's less, but still, you know, Israel looks like they're killing just, you know, almost as many... Uh, people in Gaza and 2,300 wounded. Then it has a video and it says, in the first part of this video, Palestinians run for cover after an Israeli strike hits a building in Gaza City. In the second part, Israelis in Tel Aviv inspect the damage to a building Uh. and cars after the Palestinian group Hamas fired a rocket. Nothing about kidnappings, nothing about murders in people's homes, nothing about the festival, the music festival of slaughtered young adults. Um, this is their idea of reporting. This is a publicly funded, you know, claimingly uh, claimed to be moderate news group NPR. So it, it really is remarkable. Their next post says Israeli's military is striking targets in Gaza. You know, it's about Israel attacking Gaza. Nothing again about attacks on Israel. 
there was a, a very famous Palestinian poet named uh, Mahmoud Darwish. And he once said in an interview, I believe it was the late 80s, early 90s, that thank God we as Palestinians have you as Jews for an enemy. Because if any other people were our enemy, no one would pay any attention to us. I'm paraphrasing, but he got it right. There's something about being an enemy of the Jewish people that that draws fellow travelers out of the woodwork. And they're a weird mix, right? You'll find the LGBT, you know, queers for Palestine together with Hamas, who would kill any queers if they ever found them in Palestine. But because they're united against this thing, this Western Zionist something, Judeo-Christian tradition, they, they make common cause and they work together. It's bizarre. When you see it happen, when you see them even marching in the street together, you're thinking, under no conditions should these two people go together, but it's the thing that they hate that unites them. The only thing that unites them is their hate. Yeah. What a thing to be united by. Robert, what's the future like, do you think? What are we going to see? I know you have no crystal ball. You know, you're, you're not God. But what do you see after the spark of this unprecedented war now waged by Hamas? All at war. There's hostages sitting. Right now, let's pray for the hostages sitting in un, you know, unnamed locations we don't know. But as you said, they may be in different civilian pockets in Gaza. You know, little children mothers, women. And meanwhile, Israel needs to respond. What do you think we're going to see in the coming weeks and days? We will see a response. We're already seeing it. It will ramp up. There is no question that Israel is determined to put down this threat with whatever means necessary uh, and to bring back those people who have disappeared. It will get, it will get worse before it gets better. I think maybe the most important thing for those of us watching the images that will come out over the coming days and, and weeks, God forbid, um, who knows, maybe more, uh, is, is maintaining moral clarity, right? There, there is every temptation Perf. when you see all these news items, NPR, the New York Times, and, and this one and that one, and this Hollywood celebrity, to start to think to yourself, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe Israel is somehow you know, really the, the, the aggressor here. And it takes real wisdom and, and discernment to, to hold that line, right? And, and, and saying, no, this is, we know how this started. We saw how this started. And uh, of course, you know, we have certain boundaries of, of reason and humanitarianism, but Israel needs to do what it has to do. It needs the time and the space to be able to protect its people. I mean, do we care about the people who live there? By the way, I said 20% of the people who live in Israel are Arabs, right? These, the rockets that Hamas shot, one hit a mosque in Abu Ghosh, an Arab town hmm. in Israel. One went all the way clear into the West Bank and hit a house in Bethlehem. Like, these people don't care. Israel needs the support of the world to do what it needs to do for its people. And by the way, they are also doing something for the rest of us, right? And confronting this threat, a threat that wants to get us over here as much as people over there, they're, they're doing a real service. Now, I do want to say one thing, thinking about the future. I am not indifferent toward uh, Palestinians. I've been, me, my organization, we've spent a lot of time working on Palestinian issues. We employ Palestinians. We've led, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of people we've led on, on Philos Project trips to, to the West Bank to meet leaders in the Palestinian government. Mm. And we've sat with all kinds of people. Let's just say all kinds. Uh, I won't go into details. Um, and, and we care. I care. I think they've been led horribly. I think Palestinian leadership has been awful. They haven't prepared their people for peace. On the contrary, they, they incite at every chance they get, usually to deflect from their own corruption and ineptitude. I want better for the Palestinian people. We all should want better for the Palestinian people. There is a path. There, there is a way for this conflict to end. It's not a mystery. We've, th these things have been out there for years. They, they were out there since the 30s, the idea of a two-state solution. But it requires movement on the Palestinian side. Israel is ready to make peace. They've been ready to make peace since before there was Israel. Palestinian leaders need to get their people on board. They need to be ready to make compromises and concessions and do what every other leaders in every other state have to do in moments of conflict. 
I think it's possible. I do think it's possible. Unfortunately, that can't happen while Hamas has the power that it does, which is why hmm. we need to be with the people of Israel as, as they stand up and they take care of this problem. So is the hope that if Hamas can be conquered and ultimately rooted out, there can be a more moderate government that could take over the Palestinian leadership of the Palestinian people and that there can be peace between the Palestinian people and Israel? That is the theory. And I have been working in this part of the world too long to be a, you know, an unbridled optimist. I am optimistic, but I couldn't do this work if I was not optimistic. But mm -hmm. a lot of things will need to happen for that to happen, right? It's, it's, it's unfortunately the case that the other side, the non-Hamas Palestinian leadership is actually not that much better. Like it's not, these guys are bad and those guys mm. are good. If you saw some of the stuff, I mean, the president of, of the Palestinian Authority was on camera just a few weeks ago denying the Holocaust and saying, and even if it happened, Hitler, you know, he made some good points. I'm paraphrasing, but not by much. Uh, he was mm. roundly condemned around the world, by the way, by some Palestinians as well. But that's the other side. So is there just peace in the offing on the other side of a Hamas defeat? I hope so. It is possible. This is not impossible, but it's going to take really hard choices on the part of Palestinian leadership. And I would add serious involvement by the, the Arab states. Unfortunately, even Arab states that are at peace with Israel did not release great statements uh, after the events on Saturday. I think hmm. there's a lot more that they could do to bring the Palestinian leadership along, you know, carrots, sticks, whatever it may take, to to get them to make the hard decisions that they need uh, that they need to make. But even then, I want to say one last thing. Even then, we're going to have to hmm. live with the reality that there are still millions of people in this part of the world, for reasons of theology, who are not going to give up the desire to destroy both Israel and as many as much of as, as much of the West as they can. That's important. That just to set our expectations and make sure that we're not, uh, you know, overshooting. I think that's something that is so out of the mainstream understanding in the United States that there is a, I mean, radical Islam, you could call it. I think some people say, well, that is Islam. You know, there's obviously very peaceful Muslims. So you know, that they would stand in contradiction to that. But there, that idea that this is a, there is an ideology here, a religion here that wants to destroy the West, I think is hard for Americans to really grasp, especially when, like you said earlier, Robert, so many Americans are kind of self-loathing about our own ideals. And so there's a temptation to go march alongside, you know, terrorists really, uh, you know, who would want to destroy you who are marching because you're maybe, you know, part of the LGBTQ community or whatever it is, because, um, but you still, in a, in a hatred of your own ideals, of your own country, you're willing to do that, that, you know, create that kind of an alliance. I think the biggest thing that we need to take from this as Americans and Americans, Christian Americans, is that we need to, we need our own revival, right? We, we're often working at the level mm. of politics and law as we should be, but our society, our culture is dissolving from hmm. within. That self-loathing, that comes from a sense of, um, it comes from an identity crisis, from a loss of, of meaning hmm. and of purpose. What is America? What are we all about? What do we stand on? What are the principles? It's not just freedom in some abstract sense. Our, our values come from somewhere. They come from our tradition. And I think until Americans have that encounter, the one that I'm trying to do or to stimulate at the Philos Project by, by remembering our origins, going back to our roots, rediscovering this heritage that came out of Jerusalem and changed the world. Until we understand that and kind of look in the mirror um, and then take that step of action to reconnect with uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters to the Eastern Christian communities that so many of us have forgotten about and begin to link arms between the Near East and the West. Until that happens, I don't know that we really have the tools that we need to stand up against this this threat. I mean, that's the real subtext yeah. here is that we don't we're not ready for this, right? We're not ready to confront people 
in the town square? What do we say to them? What's, what do we, we know what they stand for, but what do we stand for? And I think it has to start with people of faith. And I think it starts small. I think it starts local. I think it starts individual, mm -hmm. but not to be trite, right? This is one of those cliche comments, but for the sake of our civilization, we need revival. And that revival has a, has a mm -hmm. root, right? It comes from somewhere. It starts with this tradition, which originally uh, uh, was was born in the land of Israel. So there's something really big mm -hmm. and cosmic about all of this, even as you're talking about, you know, what, you know, the, the latest events and the political implications, there's, there's something spiritual about it that cannot be missed. And I think it has as much to do with mm -hmm. us as it does with uh, Israelis and Palestinians over there. Robert, how can people find your work at Philo's Project? And then also, is there anything that we can do besides pray right now? And also your call to, you know, these spiritual realities, being, paying attention to those. But is there anything practical that we can do to help those that are suffering right now in this conflict? Thank you for that question. First of all, you can go to our website, philosproject.org, and you'll see a pop-up there. You can sign up and get updates. We are doing a, a lot of things, and it's going to develop as, as the situation does. I think in addition to maintaining moral clarity and doing your best to preserve it in your sphere, your family, your friends, your church, community, uh, the other thing that's really important is, is acts of solidarity. Um, Friendship, the word philos means friend. That's like the basis of all this work. It's about shared values and linking people uh, together. Um, you would be shocked, Lila, at the immense power that one phone call, one text message to a Jewish friend, if you have an Israeli Jewish friend, <laughs> even more, uh, saying, hey, I'm seeing what's happening. I, you know, I don't know uh, really all the details. It seems really horrible, though. I just want you to know that I, as a Christian, as a Catholic, I'm with you. You have friends. You're not alone. That seems really small and petty, and how's that going to sure. change the world? I'm telling you, it's so unusual in Jewish history to get that text message, to get that phone call, that yeah. the effect will be deep and immediate. And um, I would say anything people can do to go beyond thoughts and prayers and actually do action, right? And what is, is really the name of the game right now. And by the way, talk to your priest, talk to your pastor, let him or her, well, not her, but let him know that, <laughs> that you are aware of the situation, that you care about this. Reach out to people in your community. Mm -hmm. Enterprising people will find ways to show rather than tell the kind of solidarity I'm talking about. Elected officials, obviously, the more you can make your voice heard in real life, in the flesh and on social media, the better. That's the thing. It's easy. We all do it anyway. Just make sure that it's properly calibrated for the moment that we're in. Thank you, Robert. This has been awesome. Thank you for coming on the podcast and breaking down so much of this for people listening. I'd love to have you in studio sometime next time you're out in California, but I hope that people can follow your work and support Philos and such good advice for us, you know, not just pray, but express that support, you know, vocally and whatever actions we can to those that are, you know, this community, it is a community, uh, the Jewish people that are hurting so badly right now and, and deserve uh, our solidarity and our support. Thank you so much, Lyle. Really, just the fact that you uh, are highlighting this uh, situation and asking me mm -hmm. to be on the show, I think already that's an act. That means a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. It's heavy. It's heavy to think about what's happening. Uh, I was just up late even thinking about the plight of those hostages and i'm still thinking about it you know of course because they're still taken uh into captivity uh you know the one image of i think i mentioned on the talk conversation with robert but a family who was kidnapped by hamas terrorists and the mother clutching her two little boys they had hair like my sons they looked like my sons and i imagined waking up one morning uh with my little ones after celebrating a holiday like many of the Israelis did, and having militants at your door murdering your neighbors and taking you hostage, and knowing that your life at any moment could be taken. I think about the conditions they're in. I think about the fear that they are in and that their loved ones must feel for them back at home in Israel. Let's pray for their safety, and let's pray for all innocents 
caught up in this conflict. All innocents in Palestine, the children there in Gaza or the West Bank, the children of Israel, those that are truly innocent, and that justice be done as Israel fights to protect and defend itself. Don't, don't forget, if you're listening on the podcast app, that you can watch this episode on the Lila Rose Podcast YouTube channel. And if you're watching on the YouTube channel and you happen to be driving in your car or you listen to podcasts, don't forget to subscribe to the Lila Rose Podcast on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much, guys, and have a great rest of your day.